Hey, it's Jamie Moore here. You're very welcome to the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast with you on offtheball.com every Wednesday. And if you're listening to the podcast, you can watch all our interviews in full on youtube.com forward slash off the ball. We're on Wednesday, June 19th, the middle of the League of Ireland summer break. So every single League of Ireland player, manager and fan is currently somewhere in the sunshine, including me. By magic, I'm actually in New York now, so uh, we've got a very special podcast for you this week over the next 40 minutes or so, discussing what the Underage League of Ireland means for the schoolboy clubs, particularly here in Dublin. And of course, changing times for Irish football, and not just in the boardroom at Abbottstown in the FAI. The League of Ireland now started under 13, runs through under 15, under 17, and right up to under 19 and senior level. The 19th League began a number of years ago. 17 started in July 2015, with the under-15s kicking off in the summer of 2017. The under-13 League is now underway. It started in March, just a couple of months ago. Now, many schoolboy clubs try to apply for the league directly. They didn't get in, even though they were very well placed to apply and very well placed, in my opinion, to be admitted to the league. So they've done agreements and official partnerships with the League of Ireland clubs, and that includes uh, the three men in studio. Alan Caffey from St. Kevin's, Will Clark from Bray Wanderers and Joey's, and John Moore, the chairman of Belvedere. And they've done link-ups, respectively, with Bohemians in the case of Kevin's, with Bray Wanderers in the case of Bray, and with St. Pat's in the case of Belvedere. And last week, the schoolboy clubs voted to return to the old season as such, which runs across two years. So it'll start, you know, in, in around October time, run all the way through to May, whereas for the last couple of years, it's run at the same time as the League of Ireland. That will create issues for everybody involved in terms of players moving and, and stuff like that as well. So uh, there's a good all the above, the lads are in the studio. Afternoon all, how are you? Good. Good, good, yeah. good thanks. Thanks. So firstly, I suppose, Alan, you're nearest to me. When, the f- when you guys first heard that the League of Ireland was going to go from 19s to 17s and since 15s and 13s has come, what were St. Kevin's thinking at that stage? I, I think our initial thinking was, you know, surely the big clubs will be part of it in some way. Uh, so when it was open for us to go and apply for it, we, we applied for the under-17s uh, league and, you know, probably weren't taken serious at that time. Uh, and kind of got brushed aside and said right at 17s we'll leave it obviously news started to filter then that it was going to be 15s and eventually be 13s so then we decided that we would take it much more serious about how we go and employ and make our point and presentation uh, to what we needed to be you know Will for you in Joey's similar story? Yeah it was um, I think when the FEI sent out their, uh, the initial expression of interest uh, obviously we applied at the time to enter into the under 17 league as St. Joseph boys um, but I always remember we you know when they were conducting the, the interviews with the, the, the clubs at the time out in Abbottstown uh, we met with Rude Doctor and Frank Gavin I remember Noel O'Driscoll brought up during the presentation you know we were talking about uh, obviously the future and that and you know, Noel was making the point about all the, say, the, the traditionally big clubs around Dublin, the Belvedere's, the Kevins, the Home Farms, the Crummins, Cherry Orchards, uh, ourselves, you know, and what we say contributed to youth development over the last 50 or 60 years. And I always remember Rude making the point saying, you know, whilst he acknowledged the contribution, he, he sort of posed the question, you know, what's more important, the future or the past? Um, so I actually remember speaking to Noel on the way out, you know, we hadn't even left the building in Abbottstown, and I said, there's no way we're getting into this, uh, you know, new structure unless it's through a uh, partnership. Um, so, so from that moment on, you know, uh, you know we basically tried to focus our, uh, you know, focus our efforts on um, you know, getting into a partnership with somebody. And for you, John, what was the story with Belvedere? Well, like the lads, we made very thorough preparations when we made our application. We had a very slick video presentation with a very uh, comprehensive financial document. So we had ticked all the boxes of what the FEI said was required for entry into the league. But it was quite clear from within five minutes of the interview that we were wasting our time because the word partnership was brought up and basically they didn't want any schoolboy clubs involved. That, that became very clear at a very early stage. So basically we wasted our time with all the preparation for our presentation. And at that time, that would have been, was that for the under-17 league or was that for the 15s? I know you guys would have wanted to be in all of them, but at that time, the 17s was, was the one that was... The 17s was the first one, and the 17s would be an age that, like Joey's and like Kevin's, it would be an age that we had great uh, reputation for helping the players, having brought them to a certain level, to bring them to the next level through. And we had a very strong record of the number of players that came through to play for the Irish underage teams. So we felt we were very well equipped in terms of our coaching staff, in terms of our facilities, and in terms of our history, that we would be able to compete in the league at a decent level and take all the boxes. Yeah, I think at that time, Will, actually, that under-16 season, John's Belvedere played your clubs and Joseph's boys in the other and final under-16, and after that match, most of the players went to join the League of Ireland clubs, and they would have been two of the top teams, along with Kevin's, in the country at that age, and straight away they're going from you know, competing at a very good level for your club, and they have to leave if they want to play at a, at a higher level. Yeah, well, again, look, it, it, 
look, it's one of those things, you know, like the FEI obviously look after football in the country and they're the ones who obviously, you know, dictated what the, the new structure was going to be. So from our point of view, you know, I know there was a lot of sort of, you know, a lot of the clubs were a little bit disgruntled and all the rest of it and probably understandably so at the time, you know, but we took the, you know, the stance that, you know, we had to embrace change, otherwise we'd be left behind, you know, so... Again, from a very early stage, you know, we basically, uh, and to be fair to Dennis O'Connor at the time, he reached out to us and, uh, you know, obviously we, we, we have, you know, I suppose we set in motion the partnership that we have now with Bray. Uh, although we, you know, we have a long-standing relationship going back to 1995 with Bray, but, um, but at that stage we realised that, you know, it was going to be the only show in town and we were either going to be part of it or we weren't going to be part of it. So uh, we decided to be a little bit more proactive about it, um, at, certainly at that stage. Yeah, we'll talk more about the link-ups and how they work in a minute. But Alan, for you, again, when you were aware that St. Kevin's weren't going to be allowed in as St. Kevin's, you were straight away thinking, well, we do need to be in, so we have to find someone to link up with. Uh, that, we, didn't have that, uh, we didn't have that thought of linking up straight away, and we were probably the last probably you know, big club that didn't do that. Uh, we just decided that we, it was in our rights to fight to be in it. You know, we had spent... The club have spent millions on facilities, you know. At that time, we had Jeff and Robbie, you know, the poster boys of the Irish team and the Euros and everything else. So we just felt that we weren't going to be ignored like that and that, you know, handing our best players over to League of Ireland clubs where some of them had absolutely no schoolboy structure uh, was just a crazy thought at the time, you know. So we decided that we would fight at every level to keep going back at them to say you know like I said we tick every box you've got to give us a reason why we're not going to get in so uh, that's the, the road and we were one of the last ones and there was times where I thought everybody else has kind of done a partnership what are we doing uh, but we just decided to keep going How hard did you fight and in the end why do you feel for all of you that that fight was lost in terms of being in as, as your own club So well we kind of we uh, we there were meetings upon meetings for hours upon hours and at times it was like I just don't know where we're going with this repeating repeating. They were saying we should partner up. We were saying no. We give us a reason. Give us a legitimate reason. So I suppose the biggest thing was where we got in. You know we were accepted yeah, into the under fifteens, which was a relief for a bit for a for a small bit. That you know it was justified. You know. But I suppose Irish football being Irish football, then we got resistance, you know. Instead of people saying, well, fair play to you for getting in and fighting your corner, and once you're in, that leaves the door open for everybody else. Uh, we got resistance from schoolboy league teams, and then League of Ireland clubs got together and said, no, we want them out. So before the first ball, I remember we had, in the our first game was UCD away on a Saturday, and we were called, myself, Brendan, and Ken, don't know what I called to uh, Abbottstown to say, now you're back out and the short season's over. And truly on the basis, because people were giving out and threatening legal proceedings and all that sort of stuff, and you just thought, well, this is what Irish football's about, you know? So uh, then obviously we had absolutely no choice to go down the road of a partnership, you know? But again, in a way that we wanted a partnership that would suit us and we would be part of it, you know. So, Will, we, we spoke about, you know, you guys trying to get into the 17s league and I'm just interested at that time in the, the summer of 2015 when that league was starting and you guys had your teams from, you know, four up to yeah. 16. How much work, particularly from 12 up, when the players are now going to League of Ireland and I know you guys have the link with Bray, but from 12 up to 16 at Joey's, the work that would have gone in to the players would be very similar and very comparable to what goes into them now in the League of Ireland clubs. Yeah, look, it would have been you know a significant, a significant amount of work and and resources to be fair that went into the teams and um, you know and again obviously you know things to be fair I think things have probably stepped up the bars has been raised slightly with the introduction doing the right stuff but uh, certainly at the time you know and it's probably the same for all the the, the top schoolboy clubs in Dublin you know there would have been a lot of work gone into the players in terms of you know contact hours and you know making additional resources available to them and you know, uh, trying to help them with whatever opportunities existed for them, you know, so it was, uh, yeah, look, it, it, there's no doubt about it, there was a lot of work gone in, and, and again, to be fair, people probably fit, did feel a little bit let down by the new structures at the time, but, you know, I think, again, there comes a stage where, you know, you have to make a decision, right, well, it is what it is, so you've just got to get on with it now, you know, and, 
Uh, but there was, there was no doubt about it. There was a lot of work gone in by all the clubs, to be fair. Um, you know, so it's a uh, so in that regard, it was disappointing. But certainly, at the I think the, it was the short season, the introduction of the short season under 17s, we didn't actually have our partnership in place at the time. So as you say, there we would have had you know sort of successful teams there, particularly the 2000s. You know, that would have gone you know everywhere. I think Aaron Bolger went to Shamrock Rovers, uh, Ryan Bourke uh, would have gone to St Pat's and, and, and other places. Uh, so obviously, some of the kids would have gone to the UK. But uh, but again, look, there was there was uh, a lot of work and, and effort went into it. How easy or hard was it, John, to convince the people in the club because you would have been involved in all the meetings with the FAI but a lot of the, the coaches and a lot of the people and a lot of the parents wouldn't have kind of understood what was going on and you guys had to, you know, let them know the message that, listen, we're not going to get in and we are going to have to try and come up with something. Well, I think that was a huge issue for the club to deal with because we have genuinely felt that we could do a better job in the League of Ireland than a lot of the League of Ireland could have done. And I think everyone would agree, a Kevin's team, a Joey's team, on their own rights, would have been much better than some of the teams. Like, we've got matches in, in recent uh, weeks, 13-0. Like, that's not League of Ireland League football. So I think we were very disappointed that we weren't allowed to get in because we felt we ticked all the boxes in terms of our coaching. And we produced the players the more than Joey's had done and, and Kevin's are done. So we just felt that we really had to a huge job to sell the thing to the people in the club because there's people in the club and it's getting bigger and bigger in the show as, as we go along wondering why should they be bothered to be doing 8s, 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s to see all their, the fruits of their work gone somewhere else and that's becoming a huge issue a huge issue within our club and within school by football in general. What sort of words would you use to describe you know, you know, the fact that the, the best players are now not with the schoolboy clubs in name, you know, at 13, 14, we've spoken about the great teams that you've all had, and now that they come up to 12 and, and they're not which anymore, it's a little bit sad, I think, in, in certain circumstances. Well, let's be clear, we're not against the pathway that's been put in place. We think the best players should be playing with the best, should be training with the best. But the problem is the number of players that have been left behind. The, whole, the current structure, which is probably a different debate to have, just doesn't work. For example, the current one of the 13s, no way can they play under 15s. So our concern is the number of players that are going to be lost to the game and their development are going to be lost. We can all think of players uh, in the past, say for example, Wesley Hoolihan. Wesley would have never been picked in a million years under 13 for League of Ireland Club, he was too small. So there's a huge worry that players that we've really worked hard to develop from the age of four right through to the age to go to the League of Ireland, that the structures that are in place makes it really dangerous for them to fall off a cliff and maybe take up Gaelic or take up rugby and be lost in the game. Because we all know about late developers and the current structure doesn't seem to allow for that situation at all. Yeah, I think there possibly could be an under-14 league coming down the line. I'm not sure if that is to replace the 13s or to have 13s, 14s and 15s. And then if they are 15, 16, the jump to 17s and so on up to 19s isn't as, as big. But while all of the clubs are still running schoolboy teams up to 17s and 18s for those types of players, which you know the standard definitely isn't as good, but there are still players there who might not be you know, at 13. They might not be big enough or strong enough, but when they get to 16... You know they might be. Yeah, well, look, again, from our own point of view, we've always sort of had like uh, you know different strands to the club, if you like. So you'd always have your premier teams, you know, which would represent, say, the you know, for the want of a better phrase, the elite players, the underage players at the time. And then we certainly would have had like say the community teams. Uh, so we most age groups and Joes, we would certainly have three or four teams, you know. So obviously that section of the club is still thriving, um, you know. But again, it's it's I suppose the, obviously the biggest difference in the last uh, three or four years would be you know the elite players as such. So. It's um, again. I think, as John said, touched on earlier on. You know, I think it will become more of an issue over the the, the coming years in relation to people who have sort of given, you know, a lifetime really of service to say schoolboy football, and they're probably maybe a little bit demotivated in terms of putting the time and effort into the younger kids now, uh, because again, as John said, they feel as though they're put maybe five, six, seven years, and then they're handing them over to somebody else. You know, so I think that's certainly an area that, that has to be looked at. Um, because we don't want to get to a stage whereby the quality of the player entering into the National League structure uh, is, is less than it would have been previously, you know. So I think that is a, a big yeah. area of concern. Well, I think one of the huge issues is the FAI decided, and it probably was a good thing to set up these National Leagues, but the rest of football has just been just cast adrift without a life belt. Like, it's just as if Rue Doctor and the FAI plan, they don't count. That we're just there to provide football for the community. And that isn't what Belvedere is about, or it isn't what Kevin's is about, or it isn't what Joey's is about, or any of the other clubs. We want to have, yes, games for the lads who are only want to play for the sake of playing, but we've always proved ourselves to be able to provide the platform for the better players to develop. And all of that work just seems to have been completely, so what? You know, get on with it. And that really is disheartening for people in school by football. There's been no help given to the school by structure by the FAI but I think the DDSL has to take a share of responsibility as well because they have to look at their own house at the moment and it's not being run very well at the moment in any shape or form 
And Alan, I know you guys all feel that you weren't really, you know, even though you were able to give presentations about getting into leagues, that you weren't really listening to that, listen, we'll listen to the presentation. But as you said, Will, you walked out the door and went, we're not getting in. Yeah, that, certainly in the first one. The first one, as, as Will said, on the 17s was just a waste of time. Uh, the 15s one, we were probably much more aggressive in how we went about it. Uh, so, so that kind of gave us a little bit of hope to keep fighting from that. But like like the lad said there is that uh, uh, the problem there's always a knock on effect and you can't just bring something in and I think we all agree that the the National League is a good thing it is a good thing you know but you cannot just turn around and say and yous don't matter you know because at the end of the day good football people that have you know brought up senior international that are currently playing they're being drifted away from the game you know, and just like the amount of coach and manager turnover we have at Premier level, because they, they want to work with a certain calibre of player. And there's only a 15s and a 17s, there's only three teams that you can't fit them all good people into it. And they're just like walking away from the game, and that's going to be the detrimental effect of Irish football five years down the line, not today. It's it's coming down the yeah, line. I think that's happening. a hugely important point because if you take, for example, the current under 17 League of Ireland players, they would have been very well coached. Let's use Kevin as an example. They would have been very well coached at 8, 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s. But if you roll the clock forward five years and you say the, the new under 13 players, who will they be coached by to what standard? It won't be the same standard because the people down at the grassroots are t- totally demotivated at the moment. Now, to compare us with the Dutch model is ridiculous because the likes of Ajax and Feyenoord and PSV Eindhoven, they have have six, sevens, eight, nine, tens, elevens, twelves, and with the odd exception, League of Ireland clubs don't have that. They're still dependent on the DDSL clubs or the Cork clubs to produce the players and to develop them from that age. And they won't be developed to maintain the same standard. So the players going into League of Ireland won't be nearly as well prepared as the current crop, as Alan says. They're going to be getting a much lower standard of player in, and then they'll be even further behind. And well, the, you know that point is very important. That you know a lot of the coaches we've spoken about the All Ireland finals and to lead a team to an All Ireland final, win the All Ireland is a great thing for a coach too. And now that that stops really at eleven, because the best twelve year olds will be gone. Has there been an issue for you guys in terms of actually trying to keep your good coaches? Because as Alan said, there's a thirteens, a fifteens, a seventeens, and then a nineteens. But the nineteens has to be high, you know so highly qualified that it's unlikely that a school by coach would be able to jump straight in at that level. Well, again, from, from our own point of view. Um you know, the vast majority of the coaches involved in our academy, you know, uh, setup would have come from Joe's, if you like. You know, so of the twenty coaches involved, looking after the, 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 you know, the four teams, certainly eighteen of them would have been, you know, would have come from Joe's. So there was a, a coach uh, progression, if you like, as well. But again, you know, we're probably lucky in the sense that, you know, Noel O'Driscoll was in a position to to purchase Bray Wanderers, to be honest with you. And again, and I think Noel would openly admit it that. His purchase of Bray Wanderers was probably largely motivated by providing a pathway for players uh, and coaches in the club, if you like, you know. So, uh, now I think it's obviously worked out well, uh, well for both clubs. Uh, but certainly from our own point of view, you know, the progression from, say, the schoolboy end of things now into the National League end of things, it's as much about coach uh, progression uh, as it is about player progression as well. So, um, I think Kevin's and uh, Joe are very lucky that they are the only partner club with their respective with Bowles and with Bray. So that does give a natural mm-hmm. opportunity for the coaches, ambitious coaches, to come through. But they're the two exceptions. Does no other school by clubs have that same link? You know, we're one of three. Uh, other clubs have no links or, you know, Mickey Mouse links that aren't real links at all. So for all those coaches... Uh, the, the same pathway doesn't exist and that's a huge huge issue and the people who don't realise that are ignoring reality we will speak in a moment about you know the importance of un- under 4s to under 12s now but you're at a stage where you're told by the FAI you're not getting in as Kevin's or as Joey's or as Belvo and you have to do a, a link up I think you know for Joey's it, it was quite obvious in terms of the geography to go to Bray yeah. but for you guys in Dublin and Belvo there's lots of clubs around and those clubs want your good players so how do you go about sitting down and going right we need to do a partnership what are we doing so the way the way we kind of decided it was that you know any partnership that we did wasn't going to be with other clubs, uh, and uh, we had to have a say in it. If we're recognised as you know one of the best clubs for development, we can't just say we've got a partnership now. Here's our players, and we've got nothing to do with it, because then players want us to be part of it. So we met. The amount of clubs we met, you know, in secret meetings all over the city of hotels and everything else, just wasting time, to be honest with you. They basically just wanted the players, and it was never going to work like that. And we were willing to stand on our own, which probably would have, you know, put us in trouble. But uh, 
we had meetings with Bohemians before, and they never really went anywhere. And then, in fairness to Keith, he started to get involved, uh, and we went back down that road. Uh, and again, it wasn't just one or two meetings, there was meetings that went on for months. But we came to a football agreement. That was the biggest thing. We came to a football agreement. You know, Keith understood as the manager. He's worked at Joey, so he understood schoolboy football. He's played in England. He understands that part of it. And obviously, he wants players into his team. So we came to that agreement first and foremost. And then it was up to the two boards to get together and discuss what way it was going to work. You know, so it's been very successful that way. Yeah. Just on that, actually, we, we were actually something similar with Bray at the time. Uh, because again, a, a Bray in the, the previous ownership, they didn't really have an appetite, you know, to be honest with you, really to maybe invest the time and resources into, you know, the new structure. So again, there was an opportunity for us there. So certainly when we sat down and did the, uh, you know, the partnership agreement, I think in 2016, you know, so that basically, like, Joe's would have been responsible from the 19s down, um, you know, so again, we were responsible, uh, responsible for, like, you know, obviously player recruitment for, our, you know, appointments, you know, um, you know, basically everything uh, to do with the, the academy and that, you know, but that was vital for us because, uh, you know, if it's going to be a meaningful partnership, you know, it has to work for both sides, if you like, you know. So, again, as, as uh, Alan said there, you know, it wasn't a case that you're just handing players over to a club, um, you know, had to, you know, it had to be, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, a multitude of different sort of facets to it, or whatever, and we had to have a responsibility in terms of continuing to help those players develop, so that was a, a massive thing for us. Yeah, and I think as well in the case of, of the link-up between St. Kevin's and Bowes, the 13s, 15s and 17s are actually called Bowes, St. Kevin's, and the, the crest is kind of yeah. a mix of both, and, you know, the, I think the coaches wear crests of both and stuff, and then when it goes to the 19s, it's Bowes, yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're next to the first team, and I think those three teams play in St. Aidan's, which is, is yeah. a place that Kevin's kind of, I'm not sure if you own it, but you certainly use yeah, it yeah. as your anchor base. And that's something that, again, seems to give an, an equal input by, on both sides. And, and, you know, the Crest being a prime example of that. Yeah, well, from, I think, with our, with our, I don't like calling it a partnership anymore because it's not, you know, from a football point of view, we are one football club. You know, we, I talk to the manager every two days, you know, Craig, Jimmy, Jer, Carl, all their managers are involved in the process going forward. So it's... No more is it. They see it as a Kevin's or a Bowers thing. We only speak about one club uh, and doing what's right for our players to get them into the 19th and the fourth team. So I think that's made it much easier, you know, uh, and people have accepted. And, and there is the traditionists that, you know, at Bohemians and at Kevin's that don't like to see the joint crest or don't like that it's SKB Bowers or Bowers SKB. You're going to get that, and I understand that. But we had an agreement right from the start that it's about football, it's about developing players, Let's put that aside. And it's, it's gone really well. It's worked really well, to be honest. And for you guys, will the same. St. Joseph's Bray, a, a kind of new crest and new colours. And, and it's something, again, even the academy that was built is used by some of the teams. You also play some games out in, uh, it was called D&G Park. It's now just called Pierce Park out in Sally Noggin, yeah. isn't it? And then you've access to the Carlisle grounds every now and again as well. Yeah, no, again, you know, certainly from our point of view, like, say, the football operations of St. Joseph's and Bray are effectively the one now, to be honest with you. You know, obviously... Um, you know, because again, if both clubs are to succeed going forward, it's important that we share resources. You know, so um, so again, as Alan said there, you know, it's a um, you know, there's no, it's not it's not us versus them. You know, uh, again, initially at the time, you know, you're going through a period of change management and all, and again, you do have people that are a little bit upset. But to be fair, I think we've come out the other side of that now. You know, and I think everybody's positive about it. And you know, certainly the thirteens and the fifteens will be sort of they play in Sally Noggin or whatever, um, which has been great. You know, because there's a visibility there. Uh, there's a connection there for the younger players and they're looking towards the academy uh, uh, teams and that, you know, and again, even in terms of the crest, the, the SJB crest, that was just, I suppose, a recognition of both clubs, um, you know, uh, and again, we felt that was important. Certainly, you know, the transition of going from St. Joseph's into Bray or whatever is important to recognise uh, both clubs and that, you know, so it's, uh, and again, it, it's not perfect, you know, it's a work in progress and, you know, you can always continue to try and improve what you're doing and that, you know, but it's, uh, but I think as Alan said there between, uh, you know, same with uh, Kevin's and Boas, you know, I think probably, certainly with us and, and Bray, we're singing off the same hymn sheet now and ultimately it's about football and it's about trying to, you know, produce the best, uh, best players that we can, obviously, you know, progressing, progressing towards the first team in Bray, so. And John, for you guys in Belvedere, it's a small bit different because Crumlin and Terry Orchard are also linked with Pat, so how does that work? Because it's not exactly similar to the other two. Well, it's by no means ideal, let's be honest. We'd much prefer if we were, you know, a standalone partnership or merger, we'll call it what you will. 
but the reality is there, are, there weren't enough League of Ireland clubs to, to facilitate all of the uh, the number of prominent DDSL clubs that were meritorious of a merger or of a partnership and this was an FAI uh, solution it's like an Irish solution to an Irish problem um, but it, need, it needs work uh, our current deal with Pats is uh, in fact just a bit expired and we're due to have talks about a bit of renewal of it shortly um, and it does need some work but in fairness to Pats they, they have been very good to us in many ways because one of the, the unspoken things about this whole issue is the matter of compensation because like other clubs we would be largely dependent uh, in terms of our finances for the compensation we would receive down the years for players like for example Daryl Lanahan went away and we would have received quite a few bob in terms of progression from him more than, than the lads would have received for their players and in fairness to Pats we have got a very good agreement with them in terms of compensation in the event of any ex Belvo player who goes to Pats uh, going away to England and they've been very good to us from that point of view but that is a huge issue for all of the clubs because like very few people in Belbo if any actually get paid for the work some people get expenses but the club in terms of their coaching structure and all we do for the players the money that we would get in terms of compensation goes right back into the game no more than does the Joes and Kevins and when that money dries up or if less of it comes in that's again going to compromise the level of facilities and coaching that the clubs can provide for the younger players and that's something that really hasn't been spoken about in any shape or form by the FAI again it's, I would say it's a warning light if we haven't got the money we can't rent the facilities or pay for the facilities uh, we can't invest in our coach education we can't bring teams to play in elite tournaments to help them with their education um, so that's a huge issue going forward as well that the FAI haven't really thought about in any shape or form yeah, and for those listening or watching the podcast who, you know, may be interested in the senior league, and we cover that majority of the time on this show, just explain, John, you know, how the compensation works and how it worked in the olden days when it was the school by clubs keeping the players till 16 and them going in comparison to now when they might leave you at 12 and they move to England four years later having spent four years in a League of Ireland club. Yeah, well, UEFA and FIFA have brought in regulations uh, in, in terms of compensation. Uh, these were brought in primarily to stop the influx of African players going into France because there was boatloads coming in at the time. But basically, if a player at the age of 16 went from a Belvoir or a Jaws or a Kevin to an English club, there was compensation and payments from uh, based on, the, on your birthday. So on your 12th birthday, if you were with Joes, Kevins or Belvoir on your 12th birthday, you got next number of euro. Uh, 13th birthday, 14th birthday, 15th birthday, and the key year is, is your 16th birthday. Um, I think that's about three times the other, the other years. So just say um, a player could maybe, a club could be due maybe up to 80, 90 grand compensation if a player goes away. Now, in a lot of cases, the English clubs wouldn't risk paying that amount of money. They'd give you a down payment as, as a goodwill gesture, and you'd agree then on the basis of if somebody, say, makes the first team or gets an under 21 cap, there'd be, there'd be add on payments. But generally speaking, I'm sure Kevin said well, out of the likes of. Uh, Brady and Henry's gone away. We would have had uh, Daryl Lanahan uh, as a, probably one of our best examples of, of one who's produced some money for the club. But that money has gone right back in to, develop, to the development of the clubs. And it's up to us now, as clubs going into League of Ireland setups, to have arrangements in place that you get at least some of that money. But you're not getting it all because, if, in fairness to a Pats, I've had a player at the age of 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, they would have produced as, put as much investment into the player as we have. But in fairness to Pats, they, they're giving us a lot more than the FAI sort of uh, regulations permit because um, the FAI regulations aren't fair to the schoolboy clubs in any shape or form. But in terms of development of players, that money source drawing up is going to be a huge issue for clubs. Yeah, I suppose Matt Doherty will be one as well, currently an ex Belva lad who's yep. doing quite well. Will, same for you guys, you've got lots of ex-players who are in England playing for Ireland, playing in, in you know, different places around, and they would have earned the club you know, decent money and compensation and then add-ons that now you have to agree and split, and I'm not sure exactly how it works with Bray, but that is again something that would have been on the list of in that actual, because people don't know that these agreements are actually written down, they're signed, it's not just, yeah, yeah. we'll shake hands on this, they're actually there in, in black and white. Yeah, again, from our point of view, you know, we, the way we've structured a partnership with Bray is that, you know, uh, depending on the number of years that a kid would be with, you know, see it's slightly different now with the introduction of the 13s because the kids are going straight, you know, into, you know, like effectively the League of Ireland system. <clears throat> but say for players in the past, um, you know, we'd uh, we'd have a, you know, very clear, I suppose, guidelines in relation to uh, if a player say had, you know, four years of Joes and then, you know, we signed for an English club from Bray, who's entitled to what, um, you know, and again that, you know, both club clubs were happy with the agreement and. Again, it's, it's got to be a win-win for everybody, if you like, you know. So, um, uh, but we, we certainly built that in. But uh, I think, as John said earlier on, uh, you know, the domestic compensation, as it stands at the minute, you know, that isn't going to become an issue in the next few years because uh, obviously the compensation only kicks in at twelve. Yep. So that's basically going to be the end of it, if you like. Uh, yep. Say the domestic, with the ex with the exception of some late developers who maybe enter the, the league of Ireland structure at a later stage. 
you know, but I think a bigger issue, you know, that needs to be looked at, you know, because it doesn't exist at the minute, is academy to academy compensation, um, you know, which there's nothing in place for at the minute. And that's probably for another day. Um, but again, all these things, you know, I don't know whether or not we, uh, we actually talk through uh, the issues that, that we might face or whatever, you know, and um, certainly think the whole, the whole underage academy structure needs to be uh, revisited. And again, there's been loads of positives. And again, you know, I think it's been, overall, I think it's been a success from a football point of view. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's, there's still a lot of areas, as John said earlier on, that need to be looked at and to try and get everybody back on board, you know, and singing off the same hymn sheet. And ultimately what we all want is, you know, we want to produce the best players that we can, uh, you know, to go on and progress and obviously represent the country. And it's a matter of how we do it. But and I think everybody has a part to play in that, don't they? And, 100%. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's trying to get everybody, reconnect everybody again and get everybody working, you know, towards the same goal. But like, I don't think you can have the rest of football just being relegated to a nothing doesn't, that it doesn't matter. It's a game of ball for the kids who might train once a week. Like, that isn't what it should be because there are, like, developers and there are players who maybe weren't quite so good at 14, might be good at 16. But if there isn't a proper league in place for them to develop, they'll just lose interest. And more importantly, the coach will lose interest. And then it, be, then it does become, like, a, a community, the old CYC, Sodality Boys League, where it's just a game of ball for the lads. But so you just on that, and I do think it's important, uh, you know, and, and, and this would be a bit of a bugbearer for me, you know, you do have some of the clubs around Dublin who would have, a, you know, an interest in player development at a young age, uh, but then you also have community clubs who maybe aren't as interested, they just want the kids to go and play, which is great, and again, you need both strands uh, of the game, you know, you need those two different types of clubs, but, you know, the days of sort of, like, you know, uh, you know one-size-fits-all approach to, you, you know, youth development, they're gone, you know, so again... Personally speaking, I think you have to sort of separate clubs who are interested in trying to help develop players and then clubs who are basically, you know, community clubs who are doing a great job and are providing football for kids at the weekend, you know. So I think that's one of the problems that we have in the DDSL at the minute. 100%. I think the DDSL are talking about bringing in sort of, it's an elite league under some different name. I think they're going to call it something like the Intermediate League. But let's call it a spade a spade. It's, a, it's an elite league for the players, maybe of a younger age or the late developers. But the clubs that will be run to a certain standard who don't get games called off every second week because their number nine is missing. And they're run to a certain standard with proper referees, proper grounds. So the players who haven't got into the League of Ireland feel there's still a chance. Yeah. And that's a huge responsibility on the DDSL to give the clubs the platform to help those players. Because at the moment that platform isn't there. And I think the DDSL is going down the tubes big time at the minute and at DCL it's act together or those players who are left behind have no chance. If we just stay, Alan, on the, the compensation issue for now and we've mentioned Robbie Brady and Jeff Hendrick and I'm not sure if they're still earning add-ons for Kevin's but, you know, they've done so well that I'm sure whatever fee you took up front it's been, you know, hugely increased in, in how they've done yeah. and that's something now with, with other players at the club and there's some you put up a graphic on Facebook the other day of the number of young players in Bowes first team now a few of them have played for Kevin's and they're either <coughs> back from England or haven't gone yet and they yeah. might go and they might earn stuff and again for you guys I'm sure because you've had so many top players go away that that was an issue with Bowes that you had to agree on well what well, surprising when we met all the other clubs and obviously compensation is the one that everybody wanted to talk about uh, the League of Ireland clubs were under some uh, I don't know where they got their information for that. Clubs like Joey's and Belvin were making millions. You know, yeah. every year they were making hundreds of thousands through compensation. And when we sat down and said, no, "That's not the way it works," like yeah. you know, that was the first thing. And then the second thing was, you know, when we were having meetings, whether it be in Shannon, like you know, it cost us twenty five thousand to keep Shannon's pitch at the standard it's at. You sit in a nice boardroom. There's a gym and there's an indoor restaurant and all. Like that's where the money is. Now, a hell of a lot of money have gone through League of Ireland clubs, millions, and they don't have a training ground to show for it, you know? So that shows you how responsible clubs like Belvedere and Joey's and Kevin's and Home Farm have been in that, you know? So it's all right getting that compensation, but you have to have something to show for it, you do, in that. So while the boys have done well in England, uh, but they come a, a, along once every so often, you know, before Jeff and Robbie, there wasn't, you know, I don't know who the next one would have been before that, you know, so it's not as if there's a Jeff and a Robbie every season, the next one might be five, ten years down the line, you know, so there's little ones in between that, that keep the club running to the standards that it is, you know, paying for your coaches, coaching badges these days isn't a cheap thing, you know, yeah. so that's like one player going to a lower club. Yeah. And again, to be honest with you, Jamie, there's a lot of uh, misinformation 
you know, and the public perception that the Leeds and Schoolboy clubs were yeah. making hundreds of thousands, it, it just wasn't, it's not true, yeah. you know. Um, and, and again, it's something, you know, again, you even speak to people who are involved in the league and who are only sort of dipping their toe into the underage stuff now, who would have been, say, traditionally from a League of Ireland background, you know, I think they're probably slightly disappointed, uh, maybe, at the types of money and the amounts of money that are being sort of uh, spoken about in relation to their players now going to the UK and that, you know, because yeah. I think they probably thought there would have been a hell of a lot more money involved. But the reality is that, you know, again, if you're lucky, if you get one top player, maybe, you know, you know, every 10 years you're doing extremely well. And again, to be fair to a lot of the school boys, uh, school boy clubs around the city, you know, they, they have a lot to show for the money that, yeah. you know, that they would have received in terms of facilities yeah. and in terms of, you know, educating players and coach ed and everything else because it's not cheap nowadays, you know, so it's, um, you know, but definitely there was a lot of uh, misinformation about the, the amounts of money that, that clubs were making. Yeah, now one of the, the issues that has been, and uh, John mentioned earlier on, is that some of the scores are outrageous. Like, I'm just looking at the uh, under-13 league here, and Drogheda United are bottom. They've played eight matches. Their goal difference is minus 59. They've scored twice and conceded 61 goals in those eight games. And I know Bowes Kevins beat them 11-1 last week, and I, I know this is an issue I have with all the clubs. I don't think scores of 11-1 should be reported <coughs> online. I think there should be a rule if it's above five or six. At 13s, it shouldn't be reported. And... You're looking then at even Dundalk, who were fifth. They've only won twice. Their goal difference minus 20. And then you've Pats on top. Goal difference plus 38. Bow second. Goal difference plus 33. Bow St. Kevin, I should have mentioned. The disparity of teams is, you know, there's some really good teams and there's some not so really good teams. And I think there has to be a league for the top teams and a league for the teams who, who are not at that level yet. And they're better games for everybody. But for Drada's goal difference and their goalkeeper or two goalkeepers who are looking at that going, we've conceded 61 goals in eight games. That's yeah. not good for anyone, really. But, sorry, I think the thing about that is, you know, um, if one of the principles of the underage leagues are the best, you know, uh, the best with the best against the best, you know, well then we have to follow through on that, you know. And again, it's up to each of the twenty clubs or whatever, twenty senior clubs, and then obviously the four, you know, the the Carlo Kennys and the Cavan Monhans or whatever, uh, the Kerry League and that. Um, it's up to it's up to each club to decide how seriously they want to take underage development, you know. And for me, there needs to be a categorisation uh, in terms of an academy. You know, there needs to be an audit structure put in place. Um, you know, because at the minute we don't, you know, we're not benchmarking ourselves against anything. And again, you know, if you ask ten different people who the top academy in this country would be, you probably get maybe, you know, three or four different answers. It's it's too subjective, you know. So there needs to be a benchmarking system put in place, an audit structure put in place, and the clubs who take youth development more seriously need to be incentivised and, and rewarded as such, you know, because it's not right that you have, you know, all the clubs getting the same amount of money for youth development when some clubs are taking it a little bit more seriously than others. Uh, and again, to be fair to each club, it, that's up to them how they want to run their business and that. Um, but for the clubs who are investing the time and the you know the money and, and the resources into it, you know, I think they certainly need to be uh, rewarded and, and helped along. I think there is a perception out there, rightly or wrongly, that the League of Ireland clubs, or at least some of the League of Ireland clubs, don't really want to have these teams, but they have to have them because it's part of the regulations, and they do get some money from UEFA for having them. But the money that they're getting isn't actually being invested in the teams. Mm. Yeah. I know, for example, without name of the club. Uh, in the League of Ireland that the kids pay 20 quid a week direct debit for the privilege of pay, playing in the League of Ireland now that to me is a joke if it's the League of Ireland you don't pay 20 quid, 20 quid a week to play in it um, but I think if the money is going in like every penny Bevader gets from any compensation goes back into football uh, the money that's going to youth development in, from the, uh, in the League of Ireland should be going to the underage teams in the League of Ireland and that will help raise the boat uh, Sorry uh, Jamie just on that I, I think it's really important because I think John's right you know, again, I think the introduction of the underage leagues has been a positive and it's a step in the right direction, you know, but it needs to be more far reaching now. This can't be a more expensive version of schoolboy football. No. Because the costs associated with running an underage uh, or an academy, you know, they are significant, you know, but again, we have to make sure that, you know, if we're investing more money into it, that, you know, in terms of, say, productivity and in terms of, you know, our outcomes or whatever, that we have to be producing a higher quality of player. So there's no point in spending more money and we still end up with the same type of player. You know, so you know, it is really important that we don't end up with a more expensive version of schoolboy football. And on that result of Drada won Bowes, Kevin's eleven. I don't know if you were at that match, but like what do you say to your own players when like the third or fourth goal goes in and it's the eighth match in a row that Drada are being hammered in and the eighth match in a row or seventh match in a row the Bowes are gonna win? What do you say to your own players, half time, full time, even during the game? Because once it gets to seven, eight, nine, it's like yeah, yeah. everybody just wants the match to be over really. And this is the problem, like everybody gets frustrated by it, like nobody gets out and out of it, you know, I was at a 19s game there the weekend where the same, it was just a waste of time for everybody, by half time, you know, so players 
our players, they start to do, you know, they start to mess up things, coaches get angry with that, so nobody gets anything out of that. But I'd look at that a different way, is that, like, there's some big name clubs there that are getting... Hammered. Hammered. Yeah. You know, and they, instead of giving out to the teams that have won, you know, they've won it, and you're right, scores shouldn't be put up, and why they put up, I don't know, but maybe they're told, I don't know, but uh, that's somebody else's department. But there's some big clubs there that don't, that don't care about their youth section, you know? Uh, so that's the question that should be asked, is that, okay, the first team are doing brilliantly well, well, why aren't your youth section doing well? Like, what, what is the problem? Like, we're well into this, you know, the under-17s is in since, you know... 2015. Yeah, no, that's a long time not to have structures properly right, you know, so that's the way, that's the way I would look at it. You know, the development leagues, I've kind of got a bit of a problem with that, that they're in it. Uh, you know, what justifies them to be in it? As in your Mon and Cavan, your yeah, Kerry League? absolutely, you know. I, they're just recently in. Yeah, you know, I, I really do. I, I have to question, you know, I get the, a bit of an argument that it's to promote football around the country, but, you know, should a, should a home farm or a Belvedere die while other te- clubs, uh, other teams that are in it that just aren't up to the standard? Yeah. Well, the Qatar League, for example, Newbridge Town had recently just won promotion to the DDSL um, under 12 Premier, and they had a good little team. And they had to pull out of the league now just a few weeks ago because five or six of their players were taken by Kildare for their under 13 team. So whatever about a player joining a Bowes or a Rovers from a, from a schoolboy club, joining a league team is surely contradictory. Yeah. Like, where are they going to go from the league team? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, the league team are going to be in the League of Ireland. So if, if the National League thing is a pathway for the players to play in the League of Ireland, what's the point in playing for Kildare? Kildare don't have a League of Ireland team. And just to explain again for people listening and watching, the, the under-19 league is split in two with north and south, so you don't have Finn Harps going to Cork and whatever else. The 17th league is the same. The 15s and 13s are split into four groups, which is more localised, but then the top teams qualify for knockout stages and the bottom teams play in other competitions. So it's not as if, you know, Drada would be playing bowls four times or Pats four times, but, so there is more competition later down the line. And will they ever see a situation where, and I know, you know, in the early stages of the 19th league, when there was only 19th league, there was a Premier and a First Division, and yeah. it meant that, the, you know, Alan's point is right, Bowes should not be criticised for, for, for winning 11-1 because they were much better than, in that case, Drada. But Bowes would be better off playing Pats more or Rovers more or Bray more, and Drada would be better off playing Club Kildare more because they're just, you know, more easily matched games. Absolutely. Again, personally speaking, I think that would be one of the developments that needs to take place in the next uh, season or two um, because again if we're going to if this is about raising the standards and raising the you know the, the quality of play you know we need better competitions for the players and again it's it's you know it, it's not fair on anybody really to have teams going out and they're winning games and or there's teams who are on the, the, the receiving end of heavy defeats every week because again you know you're going to demotivate those kids and you know you know, potentially they'll drop out of the game, they'll go to other sports or whatever, you know, we, we don't really want that, it's not about that, if you know what I mean. Again, as John alluded to earlier on, there's loads of late developers, you only have to look at the senior international team now, yep. the amount of lads who've come through at a later stage, you know, so it's important that we make sure that we keep the playing pool as big as we possibly can for as long as we can, uh, that we don't miss out on those kids, so for me, one of those things that would help that, you know, would be, you know, again, having, say, your top academies, for the want of a better phrase, uh, you know, who are playing uh, week in, week out, and, and then maybe, sorry, your development uh, academy, similar to the, the, the structure in Scotland, maybe. Um, but I think that's going to be important uh, because it'll benefit nobody in the long run if we sort of continue to see the results that we've sort of seen over the last couple of years, I think. I think just to make the point about the late developers, was a great example of actually a lad who came from to Belvo from Joby's, Richie yeah. O'Farrell, yeah. who was a major player in Joby's, couldn't yeah. get his game in the Joby's Premier team, and he came down to us for a trial. We saw something in him. We said we'd have a go, you know, give him a chance. Yeah. And Richie flourished in that year, so much so that he ended up being Ireland's player of the tournament of the Euro under seven days last season. Now, Richie wouldn't have been picked for a League of Ireland under 15 or maybe under 17, and suddenly now he's in UCD doing really, really well and could be a top, top player. He would have been lost in the game uh, had the League of Ireland thing sort of been, been more in place at that, at that time. But I think the other point about the best playing against the best, that's something that I think the DDZ have to look at as well if we're talking about football sort of for our clubs. Because just take, for example, the 14 Premier that I'm involved in at the moment, like we got a walkover last week. Home gave us a walkover because they didn't want to play us. 
Now, you know, we'd be one of the top maybe four teams, but you shouldn't have walkovers in the Premier Division. You shouldn't have walkovers. Other teams without name and it's a shame them. We, we won matches this season, as I'm sure some of the other teams did, you know, 10 and 12 nil. That's no good either. So maybe even at League of Ireland level, they sh- or DDSL level, we, they should be looking at a six or an eight team league. And if it means Belleville playing Kevin's four times, so be it. Gotcha. Yeah, we and a better quality game. Sorry, the, the point on that as well is the other thing we have to recognise is when we say the best against the best, like we don't have 200 yeah. very good players in Ireland. We don't have 100 in one age very good players, you know? And like we, we held the Euros here, what a brilliant tournament. But hopefully it showed people in Ireland and football what the real standard of football is. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that talk about football in Ireland and they have all different platforms uh, and they've probably never seen what you know an English academy is like or what a European academy. This tournament, this under seven days tournament, for anybody that was really interested in football, and I got to see nine games, lucky enough, uh, the standard was unbelievable. Yeah. So you can keep saying, you know, that was the head and the best against the best, but if that was the case, then, you know, we'd probably only have 40 players playing against each other. Yeah. Well, if you think take the under 15 under League of Ireland season for next seat, for next year, yeah, yeah. Just for the Dublin area alone, I reckon there's going to be 80 players needed to fill the rosters of all the various clubs. Now, there isn't 80 no. elite players Absolutely. at that age group, and I know the age group very, very yeah, well, yeah. as you do. There isn't 80. Absolutely. So you're going to have players playing against, it's not the best against the best. Yeah, yeah. And then what happens is, the other thing that everybody and I wrote about recently, because it was starting to get to me, was that the coaches down below from the teams that are getting, they're hiding on that it's about development. It is. Yeah. They're hiding under that. And f- of course football's about development. We're, we've developed footballers all through the years, but also the best against the best want to win in any sort of sport. Well, winning is about to, development. Winning is part of development. Absolutely. Uh, you know, but they've been hiding behind this and they get criticised. Uh, well, you know, we don't win or we don't do this because we're development players. Well... At the top, you know, at the end of the day, this is about getting our best players through and someday, please God, watching them in the Aviva that we're all witnessing now. But, like, if that doesn't, you know, we don't push our top, top players to be ruthless in how they train and how they play football. When we, in five years' time, we're going to go to the Aviva and they probably won't be lucky if there's 10, 15,000 at it because who's going to want to watch an unsuccessful international team? Yeah, yeah. Lads, nearly out of time, I'll give you one more question each and then one for all of you. John, the importance of under fours now to under twelves for all the clubs, but particularly a club like yours, to you mentioned the coaches and putting resources into those that even if they are going to go to another partner club or if you have another partnership or whatever you're going to do in the future, that they've had eight really good years. And I know at fours and fives it's about fun and all this sort of, but as they get to 11 and 12, it's trying to really, really have a good standard of coach with them in a good facility where they still want to play for Belleville and still they're, they're becoming good players. 100%. Like we've brought Johnny McDonnell in uh, a couple of seasons ago as our head of football development and he's done a fantastic job and he really has put a lot of his time in to those age groups at the very start to put the structures in place and for the coaches to understand the different things they should be coaching at those age groups that the coach is not t- teaching the kids the same thing at 8 as he is at 4 yeah. or the same thing at 10 as he is at 8 that there should be a thing you, you, at 4 you do this at 6 you do that at 8 you do that so by the time they go to the League of Ireland they, they've certain good habits and good, good understanding of the game that they can kick the ball properly so this, you know sometimes anyone can watch a video and uh, put out their cones and do a drill. Yeah, yeah. But can you teach the kids? Yeah, yeah. So it's really important that while absolutely the kids are having fun, that they're being taught the appropriate things for their age. Alan, you spoke there about you know the academies in England and you would have had an involvement with West Brom before and St. Kevin's. I'm not sure if that link is still going. But with the way the League of Ireland is now and, and in the clubs that, you know, the, the club that you're involved in, there is definitely an option for kids to stay and finish 19s and maybe go to college or at least do their leave insert at the, at the other two clubs and their partner clubs the same where they're, they're in a good environment with you know, good training and stuff. Um, how would you make that comparison to, say, an 18-year-old who's just finished his leave insert now and has an option to go on a scholarship to college or has an option to stay with Bowles for three years and, and, and then move away with a degree or even a leave insert where he's 16 but he can play for the Bowles 17s and, and, and you, know, mm. you know, finish his education? Well, I've got kind of strong views on this. I think, I, I firmly believe uh, that our best players should go to England and should go to Belgium and Holland if they can, or France, but they should go to better facilities you know, better coaches, nutritionists, everything else, uh, and take that opportunity if they're given it. Because we can't provide it now. And we're nowhere even close to being providing it. 
uh, and I and if them best players don't make the grade in England and come back, then they'll make this league better anyway. But if they're given the opportunity, I, you know, there's been a lot of players that have spoke recently in the press, young players that have come back, a bit naive in my opinion, you know, because the last thing that happens to you is raw, but you don't think about going in, training every day, getting well paid for it and being a footballer. Uh, and there's been successful people, obviously, you know, with Jeff Hendricks or Robbie Ray, they would have a different story to what the boys have. So my thing is that our best talent needs to go. They do. Because we need people, we need Irish lads playing in the Premier League or in the Championship. Because we can't have a, si a situation where our senior international team is based on League of Ireland players and players that, you know, aren't born in Ireland. And that, you know, we need to have top Irish players playing the top league uh, as quick as possible. I think the European part of that comment is really, really interesting mm. because the advent of all the money in the Premier League now, back in the day, Irish lads went to Premier League clubs quite regularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas now it's very, very rare. Like, Troy Parham would be an exception. Absolutely. But I think that the opportunities that might be there for the yeah. Dutch clubs, the Belgian clubs, yeah, yeah. the Danish clubs might yeah. be well worth exploring. Instead of cases going on trial. Yeah. Uh, and to, I, would put that, I would put that back on the parents then and say, yeah. you know, when your lads in secretary, get them to take French and German. Yeah. yeah learn these languages. Yeah. And that would open a whole different door. You and again, know? when you look at the, the you were talking to your under 17s, I saw quite a few games as well. And you saw the Spanish team, the French yeah. team, the Dutch yeah. team. Fantastic. Absolutely. Unbelievable. Uh, sorry, Jim, just yeah, on that, I, I think it's just important. I think the preferred option, obviously, would be to develop our own academy structure here and our own professional clubs with. You know, in a professional league that's well financed and well resourced, where you can keep our players here, um, you know, and help them develop. But certainly at this moment in time, we're, we're nowhere near that. Slightly years away, isn't it? Yeah. Slightly years so away. Even though, say, the, 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 the process has begun and there has been some improvements, whatever, but we still are quite a distance away of, of being able to provide that. Uh, and I think ultimately the thing about it is, in terms of players going to the UK or staying here, it, it's an individual thing, to be fair. Some lads, you know, will be more academically minded and they'll want to go to, you know, go and get a, a degree or whatever. And other lads, you know, who may see it as an opportunity, maybe a once in a lifetime opp opportunity to become a professional footballer. So it's different for everybody. But the thing about it is, from our point of view, from a football point of view, we're still quite a distance of having a, a, a proper, well-financed, well-resourced academy system that will allow us to develop players for uh, senior international football, I think. Yeah, you've heard the word football industry be used a lot, and, yeah. and that, at the moment we don't have one here. Lastly, I just want to read a part of an email that was sent to all of the schoolboy clubs about the league season going back to the, the winter league. So I just want to read a small part of it. It says, as a result of a statement issued by the FAI and SFAI yesterday, the league has made the decision to revert back to the standard season in September 2019-2020 in line with the school year. This decision, after consultation with the SFAI, other leagues and other stakeholders, has been made following the results of a recent club survey and substantial feedback from our clubs. As a result, all league matches under 12s to youths will cease on the weekend of May 25th, 26th, which when this podcast goes out will actually be a couple of weeks ago, with the exception of the small side of games 8s, 9s, 10s and 11, which will play until June 22nd and June 23rd. All cup competitions are expected to be completed by the end of June. Finals will be played throughout that month, after which all football activities will cease on June 30th. July will be a closed month and clubs are free to hold trials, mini World Cups and street leagues during this period from the 1st of August. 2019 players may be registered by the clubs on the FAI net system. Applications will be accepted, etc., etc. And then it goes on to, to to find the different age groups whereby effectively they'll be playing the same age. Now they'll be playing one year up on this, so the yeah. 14s and now they'll be 15s. What does that mean for uh, the transfer of players, say now, next season, next July, when the League of Ireland season is starting? The schoolboy league will be in the middle of their season. If there's a very good player who's 14 who has a chance to go to 15s, Will a schoolboy club sign a transfer? Will he be allowed to go? What's the story? And you said compensation. And, and how will that all work? Because the single calendar season, and I know the summer is far too long, but in terms of the movement of players, it makes more sense. But it's been voted to go back the, the, the other way. Yeah, look, the, the whole thing, to be honest with you, is just a mess, if you know what I mean. Like it's a, again, you know, you have the player development plan, and one of the, obviously, the, the recommendations, and that was the calendar season. Obviously, the clubs were given the opportunity a couple of years ago, I think, to vote in the DDSL to, you know, what season they would prefer. Personally speaking, I think the problem with the, the calendar season in relation to the DDSL, it's not the concept of it, I think it was the implementation of it. You know, you have a season that begins in, in you know, the end of February this year, and then effectively you've got a 10-week break in, in between. It's just nonsensical. But again, it gets back to the point earlier on about clubs who are serious about developing players, you know, and again, we've probably all spoken, you know, uh, privately or whatever. You know, I think, you know, 
clubs who are serious about youth development will gladly play you know, in the calendar season because there's no difference between an under-13 National League player and an, like an under-13 uh, DDSL player. You know, if they're serious about their football, they'll play. And I think the clubs are more than happy to, you know, to run with that. But again, it was the implementation of, uh, of the calendar season within the DDSL. It was, you know, it, there was too many breaks. It was too fragmented. People were losing interest. It was all over the place. Uh, and unfortunately, the statement from, did it, uh, from the DDSL and the FAI last week is just trying to hold thing up in the air again. And again, you know, I think now's the time to sit down and try and plan things properly uh, once and for all because we can't keep on continuing to be uh, reactionary uh, to, to the different decisions that are, are being made. Yeah, and I think it has to be said for all the, the three clubs you guys are involved in, the, the interest of the players is first and foremost, and I'm sure next July if you know a really good player is in the middle of a schoolboy season and an opportunity for him to comes to go to a higher level, whether that be within you know the Link Club or maybe a different club or, or the UK, you know maybe it won't stand in their way, but that's something that again is an issue, John, that will have to be crossed now next July, that if players do want to go in the middle of the season to the, the League of Ireland for the summer, or if they want to go in December in the middle of the schoolboy season for the start of the League of Ireland season, that's a period of, of, yeah. of a little bit of uncertainty. Well, personally, I was ever in favour of su- summer football. Um, Rude Doctor was the one who drove it through. They don't play summer football in Holland. They don't play it in Germany. They don't play it in France. They don't play it in England. So why didn't they play it in Ireland? Why should we be any different? School by football, I think, should be school by football during the school year. Um, but no matter whether it's a summer season or a winter season, the leagues have to be run properly. And you can't have matches getting called off because you're number nine has got his brother's wedding or something. We have to play. The kids have to play. And in the current summer season, you were playing for three months, then you were stopping for three months, then you were playing for three months if the teams would play it. So whether it's winter season or summer season, the leagues need to be run properly and the kids need to play. In, t- in terms of people like say I'd be running Belvoir under 15 next season starting in September we would hope that quite a few of them would go on to play League of Ireland in January and they go with our blessing because it, that's the next stage for them to learn but we'll certainly um, encourage them to go because it, it's the higher standard we wouldn't be holding anybody back just for the sake of winning a trophy absolutely not but I, I personally am in favour of DDSL going back to a more traditional season but I think it needs to be run properly and Alan, I'm sure it's the same in, in, in your club if the players move from the Kevins into the Bowes or the Bowes Kevins or to England. Or, or I know, you know, in these agreements, the players don't have to go to the partner club if, there's, if they feel yeah, they can yeah. go to somewhere else, they can. And that's something, again, you guys will have to organise to, to make sure that in the middle of your schoolboy season, if there are very good players who are ready to move up, that they will just move up. Yeah, yeah, they'll just move up. And uh, I think the time, uh, Will said it earlier, is the time in Irish football is to stop putting. Irish football under one umbrella. Mm. Everybody's going. So ninety, probably ninety-eight percent of our coaches and managers wanted to go back, but the majority of the club aren't operating at premier level. So maybe elite premier level needs to be looked at differently to the rest of football, mm. and maybe that should be in line with uh, League of Ireland football. You know, so it, you can't just keep saying everybody's going to do this and everybody's going to do that. You've got to look at it at different levels. Well, you could, for example, in the, in the season that's coming up, for, uh, head of the under-15, to use an example, you could, for example, have an elite eight team under-15 Premier League Absolutely. starting in September and finishing in December. Yeah. And then the players go on yeah. into League of Ireland and those who are left could maybe play in, in a new competition. Yeah, yeah. So that you're actually playing, say, six or eight teams, you play each other three times or twice and the season is over and then there's no in-betweens. But take the example of the farce of the FAI. Like, the FAI brought in summer football and yet the SFAI, which is a, 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 a constituent yeah. part of it, kept it, kept the old way. So your team's playing in the All-Ireland Cups. Yeah, yeah. You started in September, which is part of the old season. You played a few games. Kevin's would have known all this because I lost loads of players. Yeah. We played Kevin's in a match that... Yeah. Yeah. Last season, you, you beat us in. But when you go to play us in, in the Cup in January, yeah, yeah. four of your players are gone. gone. Yeah, 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 and yeah. you're putting out a scratch team with under 13's plan. Yeah, yeah. Because you're playing the FAI, are playing their own competition in half of this year and half of next year. So that doesn't make sense at all. Lastly, lads, if we can just bring it back to the League of Ireland and, and how things will work. Will you, firstly, how do you see the future rolling in terms of things getting better for the players, for the coaches, for the clubs and, and these partnerships? Do you ever foresee, for example, St. Joseph's having a senior team in the League of Ireland and keeping their own players? Kevin's the same, same for Belvoir. You know, are these partnerships the way forward and just trying to make, as you said, there are little flaws to fix them and, and try and keep going the way you're going? Yeah, certainly from a Joe's perspective, you know, there's no appetite to enter senior League of Ireland football, to be honest with you, you know. Again, what we have at the minute, it's far from perfect, but it's, you know, the structure's working reasonably well, and obviously it's, you know, it's up to us to try and improve it as best we can. Um, I think in relation to the overall underage League of Ireland stuff, I think, you know, there are quite a few things that need to be looked at. I think at the minute, getting back to what we, we touched on earlier on, it can't be just a more expensive version than schoolboy football. 
uh, you know, so there, there needs to be a number of changes brought into it uh, to make sure that it's run like a more like an, like an academy system, you know, where ultimately we're developing better players for you know for professional football in Ireland and and wherever it might be, you know. So it's a uh, what we said earlier on. We're, we're miles away from that at the minute, but look, at least the, the process has started. Um, and Alan, for you, I know St. Kevin's do have senior teams. One of them won the cup recently. A couple of my lads that, that play in IT Blanchardstown were, were in the team. Andy McKenna and uh, Kieran Murray. I saw some great photos. And you do have senior teams, but they don't play in, in the League of Ireland. Do you ever see that? And, and do you see the, the Bose SKB link continuing as, as it is currently? Yeah, I think the Bose SKB link can just get stronger and stronger. The two boards are working on some big projects now at the moment. We're working from a football point of view. We're working on a football project. So I think that, and then the new Daily Mount hopefully will come along, which will make it bigger and stronger. But for Irish football, and this is the biggest thing, I think we're here to talk about Irish football as well as our clubs, is that the gap years are wrong. You know, not having an under-14s, not having an under-16s. When I speak to academy managers in England, they just look at me as if to say... What are you doing? Are you joking? Yeah. You know, that that's damaging football. And then I suppose the last thing, it's, it's not, I'm not a political person, but in this shake-up, of what will happen in the FAI, it is massively important that good football people are sitting at the table. Not people that have platforms or people that have paid a hundred times for Ireland, football people that know what they're talking about sit at that table. Uh, and that is the big thing for me. It doesn't matter who's going to be CEO or whatever the case may be, who are the football people that are going to sit at that table and shape Irish football? That is, I think, what's vitally important going yeah. forward. And for you, John, for Belvedere, in the context of the League of Ireland partnerships and, and the future? Well, I think the League of Ireland has changed the landscape completely. And I think it's even more important now that clubs like Belvedere uh, are doing their work at under 8th level, 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s. So that when the Belvedere players are going on to play in League of Ireland, that they're better prepared. Uh, maybe done our rivals. Yeah. Like we would like, even if it's you know, it's not um, Daryl Lanahan having played for Belva up to, up to um, sixteen or Wesley up to eighteen. Then it could be you know Joe Murphy played for Belva from the age of before to the age of twelve, and he's then Ireland's best player yeah, yeah. when he's twenty four. We can still take credit yeah. that, that, that he's a still former Belva player playing at the top level. So we've well, got to be doing our stuff I at those levels. On that. We spoke about you know clubs that aren't doing it properly. I think the FAI have a responsibility to say to one of them clubs. You should go to Belvedere, and they should run your schoolboy section. They should, you know, if Belvedere want that, of course, you know. I think that's the way it should be gone, rather than just shut them off at under 12 or under 11, you know. Yeah. I think clubs like that have have so much to play still in the future of Irish football, you know. Well, there was an awful lot of um, sort of... Uh, promo stuff being done by the FAI at the time. Like, they, they, they told, say, Club, club X... You know, you go and partner with club League of Ireland Club mm. Y. Like Dundalk have a partnership with a League of with a DDSL club who really wouldn't be sort of producing any players. Yeah. Uh, Drawn are the same a partnership with League of Ireland uh, DDSL club who really aren't producing any elite players, and that's just ticking boxes. Great stuff, John Moore from Belvedere, Will Clark from St Joseph's Bray, and Alan Caffrey from Bowes SKB. Thanks a million for coming in. Thanks, you. Me. Yeah, we'll be back on our League of Ireland podcast uh, next week, and what a massive game to talk about and look forward to the small matter of Shamrock Rovers v Dundalk Friday the first game back after the summer break players back from the holidays and we'll be speaking to men from both clubs on next week's podcast we'll see you then folks bye bye